Picture in your mind a fighter jet. What sort of features do you imagine? Probably a long, pointy fuselage, a pair of powerful jet engines, and sleek, sweat-backed wings bristling with missiles, something straight out of Top Gun. But have you ever wondered why jets are designed this way? While the simple answer is to make it go fast, the way these design features affect an aircraft's performance is more complicated and more ingenious than you might expect. So strap in and prepare to fly into the danger zone as we tackle the question, why do jets have swept back wings? Swept wings have been fitted to aircraft almost since the dawn of aviation, though not for the same reasons as today. In 1905, just two years after the Wright brothers' historic flight, British infantry officer and engineer John W. Dunn began studies to design an aircraft that would be inherently stable. Dunn's experience with observation balloons during the Second Boer War of 1899 to 1902 had convinced him that a successful reconnaissance aircraft had to be easy to fly, allowing the pilot to concentrate on making observations of enemy positions. Early aircraft like the Wright Flyer were extremely unstable, leading to frequent accidents. This was due to designers' poor understanding of flight dynamics. When an aircraft wing generates lift, it also generates a forward amount of torque that pitches the wing and the aircraft forward. This is why most aircraft have tails. The horizontal stabilizers, which are angled downward to generate downward lift, counteract the pitch-down movement of the wings to keep the aircraft level. Alternatively, aircraft can be built in a canard configuration with the horizontal stabilizer ahead of the wing. This is the advantage of allowing the stabilizers to create positive rather than negative lift, improving the efficiency of the entire aircraft. Many early aircraft used all-moving stabilizers instead of fixed stabilizers with separate moving elevators. These were very sensitive to small control inputs, making it easy for an aircraft to run away from the pilot. Dunn's solution was to dispense with the tail altogether and sweep the wings backwards so that the wingtips effectively acted as horizontal stabilizers. This not only made the aircraft lighter and more efficient, but also allowed Dunn to design the wing to be inherently stable, preventing it from stalling at high angles of attack or entering an uncontrollable dive. Starting in 1907, Dunn tested a series of gliders and powered prototypes, culminating in 1912 with the Dunn D-8. These were the first tailless or flying wing aircraft in history to successfully fly. But while Dunn's ideas were radically advanced for their time, by the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, military requirements had changed from stable observation aircraft to maneuverable fighters, and only a handful of Dunn aircraft were ever sold. Over the next four decades, wing sweep was almost exclusively used to improve aircraft stability. This was even true of advanced high-speed aircraft like the German Messerschmitt Me262 Schwalbe, the first operational fighter jet, and the Me163 Comet, the first rocket-powered fighter, and the first aircraft to exceed 1,000 km per hour in level flight. In the case of the Me262, the relatively shallow 18-degree sweep was added to move the wing's center of lift further aft to compensate for the weight of the jet engines, while for the Me163, as for the early Dunn biplanes, the sweep was necessary to make this tailless aircraft longitudinally stable. And for more on this absolutely terrifying aircraft, please do check out our previous video, the German rocket fighter that dissolved its pilots alive. Another early application of wing sweep was to allow the spar, the main structural component of the wing to pass through a more convenient area of the fuselage. For example, the Junkers Ju-287, a German World War II prototype jet bomber, was fitted with futuristic-looking forward-swept wings to allow the spar to be moved further aft and create a long, uninterrupted bomb bay. The same technique was used on the 1960s HFB 320 Hansa jet business aircraft to allow the spar to pass behind the passenger cabin, eliminating the typical hump in the floor. But scientists and engineers soon discovered another, more powerful application for swept wings, allowing aircraft to fly at supersonic speeds. In the 1930s and 40s, as aircraft began reaching higher and higher speeds, pilots began encountering a disturbing phenomenon. As they neared the speed of sound, or Mach 1, their aircraft would begin to buffer violently their controls would become stiff, and their aircraft would suddenly pitch down in an unrecoverable and often fatal dive. And no matter how much engine power engineers added to aircraft, they could not seem to reach Mach 1, leading to the talk of an impenetrable sound barrier. This phenomenon, known at the time as compressibility, is caused by the formation of shock waves on an aircraft's surface. Even if an aircraft is flying at subsonic speeds, the complexity of the airflow around it means that certain regions will experience local supersonic flow, causing shock waves 
shockwaves to form. The lowest speed at which shockwaves begin to form is known as an aircraft's critical Mach number. Shockwave formation has two main effects, the first of which is to generate a type of aerodynamic resistance known as wave drag. This greatly increases the overall drag on the aircraft and requires a significant extra engine power to overcome it. The second main effect is to cause the airflow over the wings to separate, leading to a reduction or even a total loss of lift. As scientists and engineers began to study supersonic flow more closely, they developed a number of techniques for delaying the formation of shock waves or minimizing their effects. One such technique was to shape the aircraft's fuselage like a pointy-ended cigar, a shape known as a Sears hack body. Another was to make the wings as thin and as sharp as possible, as shock waves form more easily on thick, highly curved wings. Nonetheless, for several years, post-war aircraft design remained relatively unchanged. The Bell X-1, the first aircraft to break the sound barrier, had conventional straight wings, as did early post-war fighters like the Lockheed P-80 Shooting Star. But this began to change as Allied scientists discovered groundbreaking German research from just before the war. At a 1935 scientific conference held in Rome, German aerodynamicist Adolf Buismann gave a presentation in which he revealed that sweeping an aircraft's wings would give it greater performance at high subsonic and supersonic speeds. Buismann's idea was based on the fact that shockwave formation depends on the velocity of the airflow cordwise across the wing, that is, between its leading and trailing edges, and not the free stream or overall forward velocity of the aircraft. If a wing is straight, the cordwise and free stream air velocities are identical, but if a wing is swept backwards, the components of the airflow velocity traveling cordwise over the wing become smaller than the free stream velocity. This means that this component takes longer to reach supersonic speeds, delaying the formation of drag-producing shockwaves and allowing the aircraft to fly faster. Thus, in effect, sweeping the wing tricks the airflow into thinking the wings are smaller and less curved than they really are. The effects of this trick are considerable. Sweeping a wing by 45% reduces its effective curvature by 70% compared to a straight wing, increasing its critical Mach number by 30%. Another advantage of wing sweep is that it keeps the wings inside the oblique shock cone produced by the aircraft's nose during supersonic flight, further reducing drag. Buseman's ideas went largely ignored by the wider aerodynamic community, but in Germany, much research was conducted on swept-wing aircraft during the war. One of the most advanced research projects was the Messerschmitt ME P1101, a prototype swept-wing jet fighter that was 80% complete when the war ended. The aircraft and other research material was captured by American forces and formed the basis of post-war U.S. swept-wing developments. The first production U.S. fighter jet to use swept wings was the North American F-86 Sabre, which was originally designed with straight wings before being redesigned at the last minute. First flown in October 1947, it was joined two months later by its Soviet counterpart, the similarly swept wing, MiG-15. However, both these aircraft were subsonic. The first production aircraft capable of reaching supersonic speeds in level flight was the North American F-100 Super Sabre, introduced in 1956. Some variation of the swept-wing configuration has been standard on supersonic fighter jets ever since. But, as is always the case in engineering, the advantages provided by swept wings comes with certain trade-offs. For example, wing sweep causes some of the airflow to migrate spanwise across the wing, the effect becoming ever more pronounced as the air approaches the wingtips. If uncorrected, this can lead to the airflow at the wingtips becoming completely lateral, causing the wingtips to completely lose lift. As the wingtips are usually located behind the aircraft's center of gravity, this loss of lift causes a sudden, uncontrolled pitch-up motion, sometimes called the Sabre Dance after the F-100 Super Sabre, which suffered from this phenomenon early on in its development. This condition can cause the wingtip ailerons to become ineffective, leading to a loss of roll control. There are several ways to combat this tendency, such as installing barriers called wing fences to stop air from migrating spanwise across the wing, as was done on the MiG-15. A variation on this concept is the Leading Edge Extension, or LEX, as seen on the McDonnell Douglas F-18 Hornet, or the Dogtooth, a sharp discontinuity in the wing leading edge as seen on the McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom. Both devices generate a vortex that sweeps back along the wing, acting as a virtual wing fence to prevent lateral airflow migration. Another common technique for reducing wingtip stall is to design the wing with a washout. This involves increasing the angle of attack of the wing roots so that they stall before the wingtips. Finally, some aircraft also use automatically deployed devices called slats on the wing's leading edge to increase lift and stop the wingtips from stalling at higher angles of attack. 
A more extreme solution to the wingtip stall problem is to sweep the wings forward so that the wing roots stall first, allowing the pilot to maintain roll control. This configuration also has other advantages. One major source of drag in all aircraft are the wingtip vortices, caused by high pressure air from below the wing leaking up around the wingtips into the low pressure region above the wing. Since the air flowing over a swept forward wing travels from the wingtips inward, this effect is significantly reduced, with the fuselage acting like a giant wing fence. This allows for a smaller wing for the same overall lift, reducing weight and increasing performance and maneuverability. So why then aren't all fighter jets built this way? Alas, as always, there are trade-offs. In this case, the problem of aeroelasticity. All wings have a certain degree of flexibility, causing their tips to flex upward in flight. This increases the wingtip's angle of attack, increasing their lift, and so on. Eventually, the angle of attack becomes so high that the wingtips stall. This causes the aircraft to pitch forward, decreasing the wingtip's angle of attack and thus their lift. The whole process is thus a negative feedback loop which automatically corrects itself. With a swept forward wing, however, this flexing of the wingtips causes the aircraft to pitch up, creating a positive feedback loop that can spiral out of control. For this reason, swept forward wings must be carefully constructed, often from composite materials, to be as inflexible as possible. So far, only experimental swept wing jets like the Grumman X-29 and the Sukhoi Su-47 have flown, but the concept is promising enough that production aircraft may take to the skies in the very near future. Another disadvantage of swept wings is that they generate less lift than the equivalent straight wing. While this is not a problem at high speeds, at low speeds it can lead to poor maneuverability and dangerously high landing speeds. Subsonic aircraft like commercial airliners mainly compensate using large trailing edge flaps to increase lift on takeoff and landing. The wings of supersonic aircraft, however, are often too short for flaps to be as effective and other solutions are used. One is to use a triangular delta wing, which is effectively a set of swept wings with the space between the trailing edge and the aircraft fuselage large filled in. Delta wings provide an acceptable compromise between supersonic performance at operational altitudes and lift and maneuverability on takeoff and landing. One disadvantage of delta wings is the high nose-up altitude needed to generate lift at low speeds. This is why the delta wing Concorde supersonic airliner featured a drooping nose to allow the crew to see forward on takeoff and landing. Another solution to the low-speed lift problem caused by some supersonic aircraft is the variable sweep or swing wing, as seen on the Grumman F-14 Tomcat, which can be pivoted forward to provide greater lift on takeoff and landing and swept back for high-speed flight. In this case, the trade-off is the higher complexity and lower reliability introduced by the swing wing mechanism. And so there you have it, the insanely cool and ingenious reason jets look like, well, why they look like jets.